Reverend, Reverend Doctor, Donna Battle Coltrane is in the house. And she is family. For those who don't know, you may, may be new to this church. Um, pastor Donna has, was uh, on staff with us. She's our executive pastor for years. Her and her family and her beautiful kids and her husband, um, she's now relocated to North Carolina, but she's still our family. She's still um, the one who we turn to when we need facilitating and poured into and love and mentoring. And we just love her so much. Could, I'm going to ask if everyone can stand. And please welcome Pastor Donna. Okay, she said sit down. Thank you. I love y'all. Oh, for the faithfulness of God. Because God is good all the time and all the time. God is good, and because language is insufficient for how we can even describe who and what God is to us, we simply say, God is good. And so I'm thankful to that God, not just for my life and for God's faithfulness to me, but for the life and love of my life, for Dedrick Battle, for my babies, for my brother and my sister, Michael and Sharice for my sisters and my brothers in ministry who are called to walk this vocation with me. And for this, my family, the way. This is always balm for my soul. So thank you for being who you are. We will not belabor the point. I am so incredibly thankful for you all's focus this year, which is See It 2020, and this playoff of vision. And we are going to be looking at a lectionary text and so the lectionary um, is prescribed by many churches but the church universal around working through mostly the entire bible over the course of three years if you preach these texts you work your way through the bible and so the text for today um, the gospel text is found in matthew the gospel according to matthew matthew chapter three we're going to read verses 13 through 17. I think I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. It should appear, hey, because y'all are so on point. On the screen, it reads as follows. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at the moment, at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, as we bring into this place so many things, and as we are inundated in this world by the busyness and by the complexities of so many things happening at once, this is a moment, God, where we can collectively be reminded that we are to be fully present. So God, pull us in from the many places where we may be mentally and emotionally. And as you are present with us always, help us to be present in this moment, receiving exactly what it is that you have for us first individually and then collectively as your people. God, that we will not miss the opportunity to have ears to hear and eyes to see. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the racial analysis trainings that I participated in, there was an activity where they asked all of the participants to draw nine dots, three in a row across, three in a row down. Looks like this. Hey, see, y'all are just on point. Hold there for just a minute, though. So we were asked then to connect all the dots using one line without picking the pen or pencil up off the paper. Now, some of you may have 
um, successfully done this activity before, but for the 40 of us who were sitting in this training, none of us were able to do it. And when they revealed what the answer was, next slide, what we realized was that all of us were trying to connect the dots using one line, staying within the margins of the box that we had created in our mind. Now, the instructions did not say that we could not go beyond the, mar the outer margins of the dots, but we imposed that belief in such a way that we could not see a possibility to reach this outcome. We did not have the vision or the ability to move past what our mind said was a boundary. Vision is extraordinary foresight. It is the ability to see what should be and could be despite the current outlook. It is new perspective. It is new imagination. It is new life. And what can be better in introducing ourselves to accessing newness and new vision than the process and the practice that we have every day in our church or regularly in our church, which is the process of baptism designed to bring us into new life. And so we look at the baptism of Jesus. John the Baptist is the biological cousin of Jesus. And in the verses that precede the passage that we read today, we see that John has been inviting people to come and be baptized by water for repentance. And he is inviting people willingly to come. And then he says to them, he says, but one will come after me that is greater than me who will baptize with fire and spirit, one whose sandals I am not worthy to tie. And so understanding that this is how John sees Jesus, Jesus then comes from Galilee to John to be baptized. And as you can imagine, he's quite uncomfortable with that. I would be very uncomfortable with that. And so John does what most of us would do, and he'll be like, nah, Jesus, come on now, what? I'm not worthy, like I need to be baptized by you, Jesus who is without sin, coming to be baptized, a symbol of repentance. He says, nah, 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 I ain't doing that, I need you to baptize me, why are you coming to me? And Jesus just responds to him and says, no, 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 don't deter me, let it be so, because it is proper for us to do it in this way that all righteousness might be Fulfilled. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know what in the world that means. <laughs> Jesus is real, like, obscure and paradoxical. He doesn't explain anything, you know? And so I guess rather than trying to figure out, John's like, okay, <laughs> I'll baptize you. That's what you want. Far be it for me to tell Jesus he can't be baptized. And so John consents, and he baptizes him and his Jesus is going down into the water. So you see, baptism for us is going down with the old, coming up with the new. It is um, sharing in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It is the official entrance into the Christian community, right, into new life. But it is also the process or the um, practice of being reborn. So when we are conceived in our mother's womb, we are formed what in water, in amniotic fluid. So we are born in physical life out of water. So to be reborn, we must re-enter the water and come back out. Jesus goes into the water, right? Jesus goes into the water, and as he is merging out, the heavens open, and the Spirit of God descends like a dove and alights on him. And a voice from heaven says, this is my son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. We are called through our baptism. Those of us who were once blind to now be willing at least to see. And so we're going to look at this passage today through the lens of the baptism of Jesus to try to understand just a portion of what it will mean for us to have vision, to see differently, to perceive differently, to have different perception. 
because I think there are a few things here, but in like fashion, in order to keep myself under control, I usually choose three. <laughs> so I will not deviate from that practice. And so the first thing I think that we see in this passage of scripture today that teaches us about what we are required or is required of us in order to have vision is that we must be willing to do some things we don't have to do, but that we should do. Be willing to do some things we don't have to do, but that we should do. Like, I don't have to work out. You know, right? But if I want to be healthy, I should. I don't have to say thank you. But if I want to honor the gifts of other people, then I should. I don't have to manage my anger when you trifling. But if I don't want the regrets of what will come if I cuss you out, I should. When I was growing up in Anseville, North Carolina, I can remember being a kid and um, the Department of Transportation decided at one point to place reflectors in the middle of the double lines, in the middle of the highway. And the whole idea was that so people could see better at night and so that people could see particularly better at night when it was raining because unlike in the city, in the country, roads are dark. I mean, you can go for miles without seeing a house or a place of business or a light anywhere, okay? And so it was for the safety of the people put reflectors on and when your headlights hit the reflectors you can see better and so they placed them on top of the road well my uncle at the time looked at those reflectors and he says you know if they really wanted to do this thing right they would have taken the time to like carve out places in the road and place the reflectors down in those pockets so that they could be flush with the road now even I as a child was thinking that's just too much work <laughs> who gonna do that you going to carve little, <laughs> who going to do that? The labor, the precision, like, nah, nah, uh, ain't nobody going to do that. <laughs> well, when the first winter came, an ice storm came, and when they scraped the road, along with the ice came up all of those reflectors. And they repeated the process for about three years of replacing the reflectors and scraping them back up until finally I surmised that they ran out of money and no longer replaced the reflectors. Now in hindsight, all of the money that they spent replacing the reflectors and the labor that they spent replacing the um, reflectors probably would have equaled the amount of time and labor it would have taken to actually do it better the first time. But because they didn't, they did not get a return on their efforts. Sometimes we must be willing to do what we don't have to do, but that we should if we are searching for a particular outcome. And having vision requires us to be willing to do that because if we can see something that is not yet, that can be, it's gonna require a change in our behavior. Jesus did not have to be baptized. Now the question becomes why? So scholars, you know, are kind of all over the place with this, and there are a few of them that I just, I don't get it. Like, so for example, one scholar says, well, you know, we think Jesus got baptized because he was um, uh, rejecting the safety of home life in order to embrace the danger of um, the new mission to come. And I'm like, you mean the brown-skinned Jesus who was a refugee in Egypt because his king was trying to kill him at two years old and did in fact kill many baby boys and the same Jesus who came back to Nazareth and lived there akin to, you know, the modern day get Oh, that Jesus was giving up the safety of home life. Maybe, but yeah. And then another scholar says, well, I think Jesus was taking on common sin. And again, I'm like, but why would Jesus take on common sin when in three years he going to take on all sin? So that doesn't really make sense. And then there was another who says, well, I believe that this was Jesus' commissioning, like his ordination. Like this was God saying, I'm ordaining you to do the work 
in the world. And I said, okay, well, that's a bit more reasonable than the other two. But then we have another dilemma because at Jesus' first miracle, the wedding in Cana, Jesus says to his mother, my time has not yet come, when she's asking him to help with the wine that ran out. And usually a commissioning by reason and purpose is to mark the start of ministry. Like that is saying your time has come. And so if that was Jesus' commissioning and Jesus still didn't know that his time had come. Mm. So I do have a theory as to why Jesus got baptized that we will get to later, not now. And it's not a new theory. It's a theory. It is a th- you got to have some suspense. Come on now. I got to build up to something. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. It won't be anything new. It's nothing that our our mothers and our fathers haven't already spoken to us. But here is the point. The point here is this. Jesus did not need baptism for a symbol of repentance because Jesus was, was without sin. But that Jesus still got baptized and by his own admission, it was so that a greater purpose could be fulfilled. The word for us is this. If we are going to be open to God showing us a new way, showing us the possibility of what could be, then we have to also be willing to do not necessarily what we must do, but what is better. Now, if I had more time, I would work through the nuances of this because I do not believe this is a call to be overworked. I do not believe that this is a call to say that every single thing that we do, we've got to be the absolute best and we're like seeking after perfection. No, rather I am saying this is about learning how to maybe choose fewer things that we can do very well rather than doing a lot of things that we do just kind of okay. This is about learning the discernment between when we need to do more rather than just the bare minimum. Just be willing. When the time comes in this process of gaining new and better and clearer vision to do some things that you don't have to do, but that you should do if you want a greater purpose fulfilled. Second, I think that vision requires us, as based upon this passage, to be willing to accept that some things that we think we know, we may not actually know. That there are some things we may think we know that we may discover we don't know. Now, we all see through a mirror dimly, we just don't like to, or don't it like to admit to, right? I mean, this is like when you know better, you do better, but how can you know better if what you think you know or you believe that it's already the best, (laughs) right? Like this is the problem with bias. This is why bias is so incredibly dangerous because it is um, inaccuracy masquerading as absolute truth. Inaccuracy masquerading as absolute truth. One of my favorite authors, I think I've told you all before, is Chimamanda Adichie. She's a Nigerian author. And in her TED Talk a few years ago, she um, shares with the audience that she had a professor here in the United States um, while she was a student here from Nigeria um, who critiqued one of her works. And his critique was that her characters were not authentically African. Now, she was, of course, confused Uh (laughs) by this. And she even wondered, is there even a such thing as authentically African? And so when she pressed him on it, he says, yeah, you know, your characters are not poor. They're da-da-da-da. They're too much like me. So this formally, formally educated American professor was so confident that he knew the identity and the experience of all the people on an entire continent, because Africa is a continent. Nigeria is a country on the continent. That he knew all these people so well that he felt confident enough saying to a woman who grew up on that continent, on that continent, 
that the characters she developed were not authentically from that continent when she grew up there and lived there, right? Now we can all see how crazy that is because that's a very overt example. And it's also because that probably isn't our area of blindness. But I use that example to say that wherever our area of implicit bias is, it can show up just as ridiculously within the context of how it's operating. Hey. Woo. That we can be so sure of what we believe about people and about beliefs and theology that we have no room, no margin whatsoever for considering that we might be wrong or at least not completely right. There's no space for growth. This is dangerous. Jesus is dealing with John the Baptist. And I want to be very clear. This is not always obvious. That's why it's called bias. Like, there can be some things that really we, we cannot name as our bias because we cannot see it. <clears throat> and so Jesus says to John, he says, you know, John is like, no, like, you're Jesus. You should be baptizing me right? Not the other way around. And Jesus, as a foreshadowing to another conversation that he has a few years later with Peter, right? The night of the Passover, he goes down to wash Peter's feet and Peter is grossly uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And what does Peter say? Say, no, 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 no. I need to wash your feet, right? Both of them are really in a similar place. They're in a similar place of saying where you are, like your position, who you are, there are appropriate ways for you to respond and act. And you are acting inappropriately based upon the social standards that I understand. Right? They're both going back and forth with Jesus. And Jesus, in both of these interactions, are pressing them to go beyond the boundaries that they have set or that society has set for them in order to see something other than what they think might be the only thing that's right. There are some things that we think are wrong that in some situations and contexts might be right and vice versa. Look at what Jesus says to John. He says, it is what? Proper. That's a very interesting word to use. It is proper for us to do this such that all righteousness might be fulfilled. And if we go to Peter, what does he respond to Peter in saying? Peter's like, no, 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 no. I should wash your feet. And Jesus says, no, you don't understand right now. Amen. You don't get it. Amen. But you will. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then Peter says, what? Peter says, mm-mm. You will never wash my feet. He said, if I don't wash you, you ain't got nothing to do with me. Right? There is this space, this space in which Jesus was saying, I need you to trust me enough, right? Such that what you don't get now, if you're on this path of seeing, there is a portion of this path that requires you to walk blind in order to be able to walk into sight. St. Anselm had this saying, this very popular saying called faith seeking understanding. This understanding that, and it may seem juxtaposed, you all, really juxtaposed, that in order to see, to have vision, we must, have, we must first give up the need to see. I'm going to say it one more time. It may seem juxtaposed, but that having vision requires first that we give up the need to see. Right? That Jesus was saying to Peter and John, God's ways are not your ways. God's thoughts are not your thoughts. And the moment you begin to think that you know God's ways and God's thoughts to the extent with, that it's without exception, you have automatically lost the capacity to see. Because you no longer are open to God showing you what you need to see because you think you've already seen it. And so faith-seeking understanding is what allows us to really grasp these paradoxes, right? Like faith is the thing that we need to secure us so that we can explore the unknown, so that we can admit that we don't know it all, 
so that we can admit that our value is not based upon what we know. It's based upon the love of God because the only absolute that we do know for sure is God's love. And so it's not a matter of, oh, I know. And I'm not wavering in my knowledge. God says don't doubt in faith, not in knowledge. And is not faith believing without seeing? So we need faith as our anchor to ground us in the truth that God's love is the one unchanging thing we got so we can dip out there. Because God's going to always pull us back. As long as God's love is secure, we ain't got to worry about all this other shift and stuff. God's got me. And so rather than I have to know it, what if we take a posture of being in relationship with God and others that says, I know what I know until I don't. (laughs) But it requires an openness. It requires an openness, y'all. And a humility and a security strong enough that says, this feels right, but I might reach a day where God wants to show me that there's something greater. We must be willing to be open and to trust in that way vision requires. That we make peace with the reality that what we think we know, we might not know it. And finally, vision requires the work of the Holy Spirit. I could do hard stop there, period. (laughs) Vision requires the work of the Holy Spirit. One of my favorite childhood movies was The Last Dragon. (laughs) Leroy and his fine self. We all envied Vanity back then. She was, you know, his love interest. For those of you who don't know the story in Last Dragon, Leroy was um, trained as a martial artist, and his um, antagonist, he was the protagonist, his antagonist was this man named Shonuff. And when you are... (laughs) Taking you back. So... When you compare the two, right, like, so Leroy was young, show enough was older. Um, Leroy was kind of medium build, small build, show enough was kind of big and stocky. <laughs> Leroy was meek and humble, show enough was arrogant. And so they had both trained as, as martial artists, but show enough had reached a place in his training where he had gained access to this new energy form the red glow and in the final fight scene y'all gonna go look up this movie i'm trying to tell you in the final fight scene things are going as expected right leroy is getting his tail kicked you know that's Every story, the the winner has to be beat down first. Which, believe it or not, sometimes we get tired of it, but the truth of the matter is it actually mirrors real life, right? That the promise of victory is not a promise that comes without suffering, right? And so he's getting beat down, and right when you think Leroy can't win, I mean, he going down in that water, coming back up. You're like, oh, he going to drown. He going to drown. When he comes up like the third or fourth time, his face changes. And he's been seeing visions and flashbacks of his mentor and all the people who are telling him who he is. And in that moment, he has a moment of self-actualization. He has a moment where he comes to himself. He has a moment where he realizes who he is. And all of a sudden, he's able to access a higher energy form, an orange glow. And he wins that fight. Now, Leroy had trained. He had worked, and he had done all of that. But when it came down to it, he didn't just need his training. He needed it. But he needed an extra measure of power. 
to help him win a fight against a foe that had had an advantage during the entire movie. You see, sometimes we fighting foes that we think they've been up so high that there's no way we're going to be able to pull them down. And I say, you right. We ain't going to pull them down. But the Holy Spirit. I just got to do my part. Look at it, look at it, look at it, look at the passage, look at the passage, look at the passage. Jesus, Jesus goes down a foreshadowing of his death, right? He is submerged a foreshadowing of his burial. And when he emerges a foreshadowing of his resurrection, the heavens open, the spirit of God descends and alights on him. And look at what God says. God says, this is my son whom I love. And with whom I am well pleased. At Jesus' baptism, what we see is an affirmation of both Jesus' identity and his power. It is both of these things together. That being baptized into the body of Christ is an invitation to live into our identity and our capacity as children of God. To do the work in this world through the manifestation of the Spirit. That it is both. And here we see what our foremothers and forefathers say the baptism of Jesus probably did. That Jesus was baptized so that the merging of water baptism could then be merged with the spirit baptism. That being going down into the water, I also gained access to the power of spirit baptism. But y'all, this goes a little deeper. I mean, there are some connections here that I think we need to just take a few moments to consider as we look at the connections between water and the spirit, right? So when we see in scripture examples of the Holy Spirit, it is most often um, described as breath, uh -huh. as wind, right? right? right. Sometimes it's fire, not all, as often as fire, but sometimes it's fire. But you think about our breathing, right? God breathed life right. into us, the yeah. spirit yeah. of God into us. So when we start to think about breath, what is it that gives us life when we breathe in? Oxygen. Amen. What is the chemical makeup compound of water? H2O. Hydrogen plus oxygen, right? And at the beginning of time, the spirit of God, Ruha, hovered yes. over the waters. Uh -huh. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. The spirit hovered over the waters as the voice of God did what? Spoke creation into existence. A voice that requires breath. Voice. Breath. Spirit. And then we come to Psalm 29. And this is what we see. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. Wouldn't it be just like God? Knowing God's people and how forgetful we are to weave into our everyday existence a reminder of who and whose we are. What if every time you wash your hands, drink a glass of water, walk in the rain, you are being re-invited to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What if every time we encounter water, we are being reminded that the Spirit of God is hovering right now? What if every time in this day-to-day -day interaction, we are reminded that the power of God is woven into all existence, and God is saying, I invite you to welcome me back into an indwelling, back into your identity, back and to the power that I have given to you. Why? Because without the spirit, we lose the capacity 
to see what God is doing. If not for the spirit, you all, we create boundaries so rigid that are bound only by our own perspectives. If not for the spirit, y'all, we will never be able to do what we should rather than just doing what we must. If not for the spirit, you all, we will always give up in the face of suffering. That is inevitable. We will give up our hope and we will yield to like very weak theologies of false positivity and self-help. If not for the spirit, we will never be able to proclaim for ourselves and for the darkest parts of this world that this outrageously unbelievable reality called the resurrection is actually possible. If not for the spirit, y'all, we can't see. In the name of all that is good and right and just. Amen. Thank you.